I'm joined by former Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak, who uh, has also served as the Clark County Commissioner, Chairman of the County Commission, and a University Regent, and of Amy Tarkanian, former Chairwoman of the Nevada Republican Party and star of more shows than I could probably mention here in the United States and, of course, also overseas. So you're internationally uh, famous. <laughs> so. Um, uh, let's let's talk about some of the results we've been we've been seeing. We're just getting results in now. Sam Brown winning the Senate primary, probably not uh, a surprise. Uh, yeah. That's been called. That race has been called. So uh, uh, oh, Jackie Rosen did. Uh, Jackie Rosen did really well. I know. Uh, to, to, landslide. Yeah. <laughs> a landslide. She did. Uh, she did extremely well in that race. She has uh, ninety-two percent of the vote. So uh, so I I think we can call that one as well. Um, we have uh, CD1 down here, that's entirely in Clark County. We have Mark Robertson uh, with almost half the vote there uh, versus Fleming Larson. Fleming was kind of the, the, the new, you know, kind of flavor of the, of the month uh, here. He ran uh, for assembly, uh, did not uh, win, ran for Congress, but it looks like Mark Robertson, who won and lost that seat last time to Dina Titus, right. is going to be and he has the, military background. And yes. So, yeah. yeah, he'll be the, he'll be the next... Uh, He'll be the next uh, candidate in, in that race. Uh, Mark Amaday, obviously, uh, th that uh, district is only a race between Republicans, up where right. your neck of the right. woods, he's winning there. Um, Susie Lee, she's doing pretty well, too, 92%. Okay. Uh, but to face Susie Lee, uh, the top two candidates, Drew Johnson, and uh, I, I don't I think when we talked about it earlier, I don't think we, we thought Dan Schwartz would be in that top group. I think we, we, we anticipated some other candidates would be, but Dan Schwartz, former state, tre state treasurer at a statewide name recognition, he's run a couple times since, hasn't done very well. He's doing all right there. Well, and he's also put in a lot of money on top of fundraising. And uh, I, I think the fact that you said that he's been on the ballot, of course, his name recognition is off the charts compared to a, a number of those others yep. who are in the race. Even though Marty O'Donnell was the one who was right. endorsed by Elon Musk and Governor Lombardo, um, he's trailed Talk Talking about your strange bedfellows there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, in, in the portion of Clark County uh, that, uh, that uh, CD4 encompasses, and it's a very small portion, it's mostly the middle of the state, but uh, so far John Lee's got about 50% over David Flippo, who's got 42%, so it looks like Lee is, is ahead, going to win I'm in that race. I'm actually surprised that Lee didn't do better. And that Flippo actually had that much. In, in, I've never even heard of that gentleman. Because uh, because John Lee being in in that's his home base right. in in North Europe. Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah right. North Las yeah, Vegas. Part of that history. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so let's let's take a look at turnout. I'm curious about turnout. So far, this is so far. We we uh, 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 haven't uh, gotten all the votes yet, but total turnout looks like 12.81 percent statewide. Um, that that is uh, that's uh, most of it by mail. Seventy-five percent by mail, um, uh, twenty-five percent early, and uh, a very small election day turnout calculated so far. There's still yeah. Yeah. votes coming in, uh, but it looks like election day will be the trailing um, a method of voting uh, preferred uh, for voters. So um, that's that's really amazing that the mail turnout is so high of what we have yeah, now. It's very high. Yeah. When I say mail, I mean mail in, not men. Right. Uh, only right. voting. I want to make sure yeah. to make that perfectly clear. Seventy-five percent is significant. It's it was only fifty percent last time. Now those numbers may equalize as the uh, as, as as things come back, um, but uh, but that's uh, that's turned out so far. But you uh, still get more mail too. That'll keep trickling in for the yeah. next few days. And and that's that that's just really amazing. If it if if it is less than uh, seventeen eighteen percent, that's going to be the lowest turnout in the last twenty-five yeah. years. And, uh, and, and it's not like there's, race, there's not races on the ballot that would draw people there. Now, you mostly had to be a partisan because there's a lot of races that only nonpartisans can vote in. Yeah. It's mostly judges and school board members and, and all of that. Nonpartisans, you know, I've heard it time again on Twitter and other places feel excluded from that. There's a question on the ballot coming up in November that would have open primaries. Everybody could vote in the primary. Um, but we don't know if that's going to pass. It passed last time. If it passes this time, it becomes law. Really big change in the way we do things yeah. uh, than, than we've done before. Um, you know, when you ran for governor, uh, you just said, vote for me. Right. Now you have to say, hey, vote for me. But if I'm not your first choice, make me your second Six, choice. Yeah, so I, choice. I'm okay yeah. with that. It, yeah. it introduces some humility, I guess, uh, to running for office because you want to be everybody's first choice. So, so that'll, be, uh, that'll be on the ballot. We'll talk about that in, in November. But... Uh, so, um, so let's see if we have, do we have questions so far? 
Do you want to let them know they can ask questions? Yes, absolutely. If you have a question for myself or either of our two great guests here, uh, just go ahead and, uh, and post that question, uh, and we will, uh, we will ask it and, and try to answer it on air uh, as, we, as we look at some of, these, uh, some of these other numbers, some of these other races here. We're doing this live, so this is live TV, so who knows. Um, uh, we'll get a little bit into the weeds. Uh, some of, the, some of the, uh, these state legislative races, which are going to be so important for the control of the legislature, if, mm -hmm. if uh, Governor Lombardo does not uh, prevent a two-thirds supermajority, his veto pen, which he used a lot yeah. last yeah. time, 75 vetoes yeah. uh, in, in a single session is a record. And, uh, and is it a record? It is a record. Oh, interesting. For a single session, okay. uh, Governor Sandoval had 94 vetoes over four sessions. Interesting. In 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 uh, in two terms, mm -hmm. so uh, so I think Governor Lombardo is on track to to beat that probably in this next session, uh, if if unless uh, the Democrats get a veto-proof majority, and then it's you know it's going to be overriding a time uh, we we're overriding like we haven't seen since the days of Jim Gibbons. Gibbons, right, I remember, yeah. <laughs> who holds the record of being the most overridden Ridden governor. Uh, yeah. governor. Oh, um, man. <laughs> so, um, so in, in our uh, State Senate District 1, uh, we had, uh, we had a uh, uh, interesting thing. The Democratic Caucus has endorsed some candidates, but that has not stopped uh, members of the Assembly who are also Democrats from running against those candidates, and District 1 is one of those. Um, and it looks like the, the caucus endorsed candidate Shelley Crawford is beating Claire uh, uh, Thomas in that race just barely 54 to 46 that's that's pretty tight but it's one of those things that uh, you know people say Democrats have just a, a stranglehold and I know the governor's gonna laugh at that whole thing trying to trying to herd those cats in the in, in the caucus right. uh, that didn't stop some of these Democratic candidates from saying no I'm you know I don't care if you endorse somebody no, else. they I'm have their own here. vision their own agenda the candidates do and they'll they're not afraid to run through that name well hat. I think historically overall Democrats do do a much better job at wrangling the cats where Republicans you know they're they're not known for telling their candidates when they can and can't run right. and that's why you saw you know in the last presidential election we had what 14 15 16 <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean the number just kept growing uh, and, and that does become a problem sometimes. I, I think, you know, who are you to say that you can or can't run? But, um, but I think historically Democrats have done a better job at that. Pro probably a little more party yeah. discipline. Yeah. Um, and speaking of discipline, the Culinary Union has been trying to discipline some of the members from, from the legislature who voted against that bill that would require cleaning. daily room cleanings. Mm. Um, now, I don't know about you guys, when I go on vacation, I like to have the room cleaned every day. Sure. Um, yeah. and, and, uh, but some people don't, some people don't want it. And so the culinary wanted to have that as a law. They negotiated it eventually in their contract, but they wanted that to be a law. Uh, and, uh, and that law failed. It was a clash of the titans. The resort association was against it. The culinary was for it. The resort association won, and now the culinary is trying to take uh, out some of these candidates who did that. So far, we're seeing in Senate District 3, one of those races play out. Rochelle Nguyen, the incumbent, she's got 55%. Uh, and uh, uh, Giaconda Hughes, uh, who's the daughter of the former secretary treasurer of the culinary, she's got 44%. Uh, percent. So we'll see. We'll keep an eye on that race and see how that, uh, how, how that shakes out. Um, and, and these numbers are early. They don't they're really very early. Like yeah. today's votes. They're yeah, these vo votes. these numbers we should stress. These numbers will change over the course of the night. This is not the end all at all. This is just what we know at this exact time. I'm literally reading this off my phone here. Uh, so uh, one more, and that is Dean O'Neill, uh, who is an incumbent state senator, uh, who uh, faced uh, headlines that she was under investigation by the FBI. That has not stopped the voters in her district. She's, she's winning with 72% wow. of the vote Easily. over Regent Laura Perkins, who decided on the last day, literally the last day of filing, to run for office. She's got 27% wow. so far. So that's, uh, those, those are some interesting, uh, interesting numbers uh, so far in, that, uh, in those races. Um, probably not uh, looking through here to see if there's any other surprising uh, things. Uh, in Senate District 18, to replace uh, uh, Scott Hammond, who took a job in the, uh, uh, the I was going to say the Sisolak administration, the Lombardo administration, uh, is uh, John Steinbeck, the Clark County Fire Chief, who's retiring, is, is leading with 60% uh, of the vote. So he was endorsed uh, by, uh, by uh, Governor Lombardo. 
the first time I think an ex-cop endorsed an ex-firefighter for anything. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's a <laughs> story. Simon had great name recognition from he, all this time on the fire department. He does. He does. He does. And stuff. I am told he is related to the author uh, oh, in, in some way. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so I will be I will be looking at his press releases yeah. to see if some of the flair uh, <laughs> comes through. So uh, let's look, and I think we have some questions so far. Let's go. Let's, uh, let's yeah, hear our questions. Yeah, can we talk about um, the vote counting? We know that usually takes kind of a long time, um, but I think that our Secretary of State said that he made some changes this year. People are wondering, what are those changes? Do you think they'll actually make the process faster? Uh, so far, they have not made no, the process no. faster. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, they, they did uh, speed up the time when they could begin counting votes. Um, the, the, there's, there's a lot of secrecy attached to the vote uh, because uh, people don't want uh, to, the results to leak out before everybody has finished voting because right. that could affect sure. how you vote. If you, if you see one of these races and somebody's winning with 75%, you're like, well, I don't need to vote yeah. in that race. Uh, so, uh, so, so consistent with trying to keep things secret, uh, allowing people to count votes earlier uh, I think is is uh, what the, what they said, and once they get those votes counted earlier, as soon as the last voter is voted, then they can release those numbers, which I think we're seeing uh, some of those numbers being released uh, right now. But um, uh, could we do more? Are there things we it, could do it's more? It's a tedious process. It's a slow process. So you think about after the last person votes, they got to close on the polling station, then drive those actual cartridges down the election center. That takes time. You know, some of these outlying yeah. ones. I know when I was chair of the county commission. You got to drive with the votes from Laughlin. I mean, that's an hour and a half, two-hour drive. Yeah. So that causes and mesquite. a delay. Mesquite's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so some of the outlying areas take a little bit longer to get in there, and uh, people get frustrated. I think the exciting thing, though, to look forward to in the future is the fact that the Secretary of State wants to revamp the way the votes are tallied. So instead of each county mm -hmm. having to tell the state, "Here's our numbers," and then after midnight, the state's a, you know, a, able to announce those numbers. It's now going to be top down. So everything will be distributed into one data center. So that way, everyone statewide will see live at the same time. Yeah, which is, which is that'll you know, be helpful. We definitely want that because, you know, on election night, of course, you know, especially we in the media, we want to be able to tell you who won. Sure, right. And the candidates themselves, I mean, as you well They're know, yeah. You're sitting in your hotel Engineer. suite. You're sitting at your party. Right. You want to know who won and well, by how much. I remember much. when Barbara Sagaski was Secretary of State and people were bombarding her with calls. You know, why is this county taking forever? Why, how come you're not relaying the numbers? I can't. She can't relay the numbers. Our Secretary of State can't relay the numbers. Because she doesn't have them. Right, because she doesn't have them. So I think this whole revamp will be a huge uh, benefit. Yeah, and if you think the Laughlin to Las Vegas drive is bad, uh, then you've got some rural counties that oh, are yeah. even more spread out oh, yeah. where they have to do that exact that exact same thing. So, um, all right, so so there we have that question. What, what's, what's next? What's our, what's our next question? Um, we're hoping that you can explain some of the confusion around, you know, I live in Las Vegas, but I don't get to vote for the mayor <laughs> of Las Vegas, right. which a lot of people are just kind of finding out in the last couple of days that they're not gonna get to vote in that race. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. This is a question we got a lot, including here in our yeah. own newsroom, yeah. uh, with people getting ballots and not seeing the, those mayor's races on it. And it's, and it's our own fault, really, because we call the entire valley Las, Las Vegas. Vegas. Right. And everyone thinks that the mayor of Las Vegas is the mayor of the entire valley. And that is not the case. The mayor is a mayor of a certain geographic area. And most people, uh, newcomers especially, but people outside Las Vegas are shocked to learn that the Strip is not in the right. city of Las yeah, Vegas. Much if you're county. north of Sahara, you're probably in the city and you're south of Sahara, you're in the county. And it's confusion every election. Every time someone new moves here, I get people ask me on a regular basis, so I live in Las Vegas, it's not on my ballot. And you got to explain to them that you live, don't live in the city, you live in unincorporated Clark County. So you don't vote for the mayor or city councilman, you vote for a county commissioner. Yeah, and, and county commissioner, one of seven people right. uh, uh, instead of, and, and there's no such thing as a countywide executive. The, the commissioners choose right. a member to, be, to serve as chairman, right. usually, usually for, for one four-year term, but you, you had like, I think, two or three. Yeah, usually you get two years, I had three two-year terms. Three so two-year terms, so, so, so uh, 
Um, uh, and, and people have asked, what can we do about this? And, and there are things you could do. You could consider consolidation. That has been around for mm -hmm. as long as I have been living in yeah. Las Vegas. Yep. That has been around. Uh, it, no progress has been made. The only consolidation that was ever done is the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. They came together in 1973, and that is the last time anything was consolidated. Right. Well, it's hard for people to give up power and positions once yep. they've already been established. Right. Yeah. And, there, and, there was very, and, there, and there are very few people, like former city councilman Arnie Adamson, who us old-timers remember, uh, is the only person I've ever said, I ever heard say, I would give up my seat on the city council if we consolidated. I would Arnie. volunteer to <laughs> give up my seat. Yeah. Uh, as it turns out, he did, but it is because he ran against Oscar Goodman. Oh, and, oops. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that Goodman era ending tonight uh, with, uh, with uh, the election of the first non-Goodman uh, in in uh, the last 25 years in the city of Las Vegas. That's pretty wild. Yeah. What's our next uh, What's our next question? Um, on that same note, do you think that the policies of the mayor of Las Vegas still impact the people who live in Clark County and can't vote for the mayor of Las Vegas, or are there kind of blurred lines there? There, I think there are blurred lines in the minds of the public. But I, I, I'm going to send this to to Governor Sislak because you were chairman of the county commission. Uh, Carolyn Goodman was mayor of the city of Las Vegas. Everybody outside of Las Vegas thought she was right. the mayor of right. the Strip. They would open restaurants and want the mayor to come right. and didn't realize that she's out of her jurisdiction. Yeah. And, it, it, it was and continues to be a big jurisdictional dispute. Uh, she had a key to the city and the county came up with the key to the Strip because the Strip was all in and we had uh, movie productions and the county wanted to make sure that they got first seating or priority as opposed to the mayor. and. There were turf wars in that, and they continue to be turf wars in that. Yeah, in regular. It's it, it's it, 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 it's it's kind of frustrating. I mean, uh, at the airport, there were signs that say "Clark County welcomes you," and I think that's probably the first time yeah. most people ever heard the words "Clark, Clark County. County." Yeah, they didn't know uh, what Clark yeah. County what what Clark County was. Right, and yeah. I, there was one former county commissioner that I recall, Yvonne Atkinson Gates, who wanted to, and uh, when she was serving as chair of the county commission, wanted the title mayor of Clark County. She wanted that title, like on her business cards. Okay, and then what about the Welcome to Las Vegas sign right on the strip? That's confusing. That is right. Yeah. That is, yeah. doesn't say Clark Welcome County. to Clark County. No, it doesn't. And, and that is because if you live, uh, if you live in, in Southern Highlands, for example, your mail comes to an address that says Las Vegas. Right. So you could be un forgiven for thinking, oh, I'm in the city of Las Vegas. You're not. You're in Clark County, but we don't make it easy to figure it out. Especially for new people. You know, most of us that have been here for a period of time understand that's the way it is. But for new people moving to town, you move to Las Vegas and you really don't live in Las Vegas. You live in Clark County, most people. And, 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 and that is hard for, for a lot of people to kind of figure out uh, what, what's, what's, uh, what they're dealing with there. So, all right, what's our next, uh, what's our next question? Um, for some of the people who have just joined, can you kind of recap, like, what are the major races that we're paying attention to tonight? Right. Okay. So we are paying attention to obviously the United States Senate, uh, the Republican primary in the United States Senate, because Jackie Rosen is uh, is winning that overwhelmingly, 92 percent. What I like to call Saddam Hussein numbers. She's got that in the bag. Sam Brown is 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 really doing uh, a good job in his primary. He's got 56 uh, percent in that primary. So that that's definitely a race we're paying attention to. Also, the House of Representatives. Um, we, uh, we have District 1 that's entirely within Clark County. It looks like Mark Robertson is going to be the, uh, the uh, candidate there, uh, but based on what we know so far. Uh, Susie Lee, also Saddam Hussein numbers, uh, getting 92% uh, so far at this point. Um, uh, Drew Johnson and Dan Schwartz really fighting it out in Congressional District 3. Um, and we'll see. We'll see who uh, wins that one. Uh, John Lee and 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 David Flippo. Uh, John Lee's got a 50 percent. Uh, David Flippo 42 percent. It's really going to uh, a lot is going to depend on those other rural counties. Mm -hmm. How many right. uh, votes uh, come in there? Um, and we'll see. We'll see about that. So we'll we'll be following those races. We're also going to follow the mayor's race. Uh, the last I checked on the mayor's race, it looked like Shelley Berkeley and Victoria Seaman were fighting it out. If neither one of them gets 50%, both of them will go on to the general election uh, in uh, November. And uh, we're going to be also looking some some legislative races uh, to look at uh, here, uh, only because that is going to determine really the control of the legislature 
uh, is going to determine how the next legislative session goes. Uh, whether or not Governor Joe Lombardo will still have some influence with his veto pen, uh, the, probably a nightmare for any governors to have a mm -hmm. uh, opposite uh, party control the legislature uh, with a two-thirds supermajority that can override any veto. Um, and, uh, and, and that would really uh, obviate the need for any kind of compromise uh, because the Democrats could do whatever they want. And, uh, and the governor wouldn't have anything really to say about it. Well, so. I, that's why I think we saw him endorse as many candidates as he did. Yeah. Um, because these were candidates who were not election deniers. They weren't causing, you know, unnecessary problems. Um, these are people who were mo more viewed as maybe more moderate or reasonable. Um, people who would still be able to help the governor uh, get everything accomplished that he needs while still being able to work across party lines. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I want to point out, excuse me for interrupting, yeah. Steve, is part of the lackluster, I think, turnout might be attributed to the fact that there weren't a lot of contested races on the Democratic side. Yeah. You know, the, we've got incumbent congressmen that are all running again, incumbent U.S. senator. So there weren't the top of the ticket type things to draw people That's out. True. Yeah, which there, made a difference. There are a lot of races. If you go through the county's list, there are a lot of races listed in white, which means there is no primary at all. So maybe only one Democrat and one Republican filed. Right. In that mm -hmm. case, both of those candidates go on to the general immediately. Um, I saw uh, that up north in school board races. Yeah, yeah, and 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 in nonpartisan races as mm -hmm. well. So, uh, uh, Governor, I was going to ask you in, in terms of endorsements. Um, uh, uh, you didn't do a lot, as, certainly not, not as much mm -hmm. as Lombardo did, with the legislature. Um, and there, I there is this notion of, of sort of a separation, right? That the, that the legislative caucuses, Republican and Democrat, mind their business while you mind the executive right. business. And, and, and there might have been some resentment had you come in and tried to say, I'm endorsing this right. person, this person especially if it wasn't necessarily coordinated with the caucus leaders. Did that, you have a Democrat trifecta, though, or no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we did. We had him. But we, he I think he's talking about in the elections <laughs> going in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you do face that. Sometimes the endorsement can be helpful. A lot of times it can be hurtful. You know, where they don't want to vote for somebody because so-and-so is endorsing him or so-and-so uh, isn't endorsing him. So it, it, you kind of keep your nose out of other people's business. You know, you let the people decide. I don't think that most of our voters are voting for someone because so-and-so endorses them or so-and-so endorses them. I mean, uh, all the unions that make endorsements, political leaders make endorsements, athletes and uh, you know, entertainers make endorsements. I don't know how many people in the end ultimately it affects. Hmm. That it makes them decide, okay, I'm voting for that person because this group endorsed yeah. them or whatnot. Because, you know, the unions do their endorsements. and. A lot of union members don't follow those endorsements. Yeah. I've got to ask about Trump at this point, though, because, sure. because uh, two things about that. Uh, uh, Trump endorsement was heavily sought by Sam Brown. I mean, he traveled to Mar-a-Lago to ask the president for right. his endorsement himself. That's a long flight. That's, that's yes, a four-hour flight going and five hours coming back. Um, that's the first question. Second question is the, uh, the, the people that I would most expect to say, stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell, for example, right. or the Speaker of the House, yeah. have said nothing like that. The, 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 the jealous guarding of the legislative prerogative seems to have worn away. And, and so talk about that as well. Well, it's interesting because President Trump finally, at the last minute, endorsed Sam Brown. Right. Even though Sam Brown the entire time had the backing and the blessing of Mitch McConnell, of Americans for Prosperity, um, you know, a number of people in groups that President Trump uh, claims to be the swamp, and yet still he caves in the end t to the swamp. So I actually think that what's going to happen is, uh, you know, when Sam wins tonight, Trump will do a victory lap. And if and when Sam loses in the general to Jackie, he's going to blame it on the swamp. So. <laughs> I think that I, that's true. You heard it here. I think that's what's going to happen. So he's in a no lose scenario because he can. Correct. Know. It is amazing, though, the amount of times that Donald Trump and uh, Mitch McConnell are not on the same page. No, no. Where Mitch McConnell has chosen one candidate and Trump has endorsed another. Yeah, but I think it's safe to say since we've already discussed, you know, we have roughly a month of voting. You know, mail and ballots, they're mm -hmm. issued out roughly three weeks out. You have two weeks of early voting. Then you had election day. So if you're able to do any exit polling or if there's any legitimate polling, it seems to all kind of look the same. 
it's safe to say if you're 40, 50 percent ahead of whoever is in second and third, that person's most likely going to win. Sure. So this was a very safe endorsement for President Trump. Yeah. yeah. yeah the Trump endorsement is sought after more yes. than most other ones are. And I think it's partly what Amy has said. And it's also that his base is so rabid. I mean, when you look at the fact that, you know, Sunday it was, what, 105 degrees out and there's 2,000 people in Sunset Park we're in a blistering heat yeah. to, to get a glimpse. Uh, yeah. He's got a very... And if it's one of those, oh, I don't know if I like this candidate or that candidate, it might sw uh, swing you over. It might just put the finger on the scale. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's funny, too, because there, there's always exceptions. Uh, President Trump endorsed Joe Lombardo mm -hmm. um, after saying that Clark County was a, a cesspool <laughs> of crime. Cool. <laughs> and he was the sheriff at the time. Um, and the party, the, the Nevada Republican Party that you used to head, yeah. uh, went with... Um, with um, hey, we were saying at the time. <laughs> Help me with his name. Uh, Joey Gilbert. Yeah. Went with Joey Gilbert. Yeah. And, uh, and that wasn't the only time. Uh, uh, President Trump endorsed Adam Laxall, mm -hmm. uh, who he has subsequently had some unkind things to say about because Laxall joined the DeSantis for president campaign. Sure. And, and the party went with uh, Sam Brown, mm -hmm. endorsed Sam Brown. Uh, so it's not always complete. I mean, uh, I agree with you. Uh, the, the, the people at that rally yeah. were rabid, yeah. absolutely rabid, and, and, and very loyal. Of very the loyal. I'm not criticizing it. To have that loyal of a base is incredible. But they, but they can change their minds or disagree with the president at, at some at some point as well. So there they is can, some. Can but they don't, and they probably won't. Right now in November. Not in not, not when it counts in November. I guess yeah. perhaps they was it was the primary, so they thought, yeah. well, we can. Well, play they, they can here. pick and choose. You know, you can be a Republican who may have questions about another Republican, yeah. but if you're a certain Republican who's already very loyal and devout at you know to Trump's base then you're you're allowed to question and name call other Republicans so there really is no black or white scenario like you're saying mm. it's really are you in their circle or are you out of oh, their circle, circle. Yeah. you have to be a hundred percent purist in order to stay in that circle right. in order to be given and granted permission to knock other Republicans, you need to be in that circle. Otherwise, if you ask too many questions or you, they don't like that question, you're out of that circle and you're not allowed to criticize. So it, it's not a black and white situation. Hmm. It's pretty sad. And, uh, and uh, let's see, let's, let's go to our next question. What, what do we have here? Um, this one I think is a good one for Amy. Mm. Um, <laughs> so with some of these um, state house races, or not state house, US house races, where we have, we're waiting to see who the Republican uh, candidate will be on the ballot in November. What do you think are the issues that voters are weighing on the Republican side when they're deciding that candidate? I think it would be the same despite party registration. Uh, you're looking at economy, you're looking at, um, you know, national security. Immigration. Immigration, yes. Um, you know, and whether if you're pro-life or pro-choice, it's still, it was, it was a winning issue last time with especially the Democrats, but you're going to look at social issues, you know, dealing with um, abortion, you know, looking at LGBTQ rights. Um, these are things that are never going to go away. And so you're going to have to make sure that your messaging is, is one that um, is going to appeal to the masses, especially since I know that these races are partisan, but we have the fastest growing third party registration registrations going on. So now that these candidates are going to go into the general, you have to be able to pivot to some extent and have have that message for all. It can't just be for one um, or else you're not going to succeed in a state that has the majority of the party registrants as third. And then you have Democrats and then Republicans trail in third. So we have an uphill battle. Well, part of that is because of you know, the fact that it's a default registration. For nonpartisans on yeah. the Oh, never thought I'd hear that come out of it. Which Democrat is, you're, that's mouth. why you're getting more <laughs> nonpartisans, you know. Well, they, they, it's true. I mean, you go to the DMV, if you don't select a party preference, sure. they'll, they'll put you down as, as nonpartisan. But it's very um, easy to fix if you pay attention. It's not that hard. Well, but, but the, the, what I was going to say was that the trend of nonpartisan registration going up yeah. and partisan registration going down was uh, has been going on for 20 years, long before the default registration. So that was yeah. that was mm -hmm. uh, the, the the DMV certainly accelerated it. Sure, yeah. I would I would agree with that, but I would say 
even more so at this given moment, this snapshot in time, with the disappointment in the rematch of Biden and Trump, people are really unhappy with those being mm -hmm. the two main choices. So it's gonna trickle down and people said to heck with this, it's a nightmare, I'm sick of it, I wanna have other options, I'm going third party. Hmm. I've heard that a lot. It, it, and it's interesting too because, and, and, and this will be the one and only time that I ever compare politics and religion together because they should be separate and under the Constitution of the United States they are separate. Um, but you see a lot of people, uh, uh, including in evangelical churches, saying the same thing, that churches have become more political, mm -hmm. and yeah. they say, I'm out. I don't want to be known as or associated with evangelical anymore because it has become associated with politics. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true for a lot of party members. They say, you know what, uh, th this party, uh, if you're a Democrat, uh, some, of the, some of these woke policies is just too much. I don't agree with it. I don't want to be associated with mm -hmm. that. John Lee said he left because the socialists took over. They actually did. The Democratic they Socialists did of for America a, actually for a did minute there. take yeah. over. <laughs> um, and, and then Republicans, uh, the, there are, I believe, I continue to believe this in my heart. I may be wrong, but you tell me if I am. There are Republicans who are the Republicans of my youth yeah. who believe in low taxes, strong national defense, uh, personal responsibility, limited government, uh, uh, limited regulation, those mm -hmm. kind of things. And, and who are not obsessed with social issues and who are certainly not the type of people who would join uh, in with, uh, with Donald Trump just because Donald Trump's political philosophy is so, so difficult to ascertain. Um, you, you well, most people don't realize he, he's, pretty, he's pretty moderate in, in a number of areas. Right, right. And I think it just gets overshadowed with the rhetoric, unfortunately. And that's where the toxicity comes in. And so you're talking about, you know, the Republicans that you grew up with or the Reagan Republicans, yeah. you know, that are being silenced to some degree um, because they don't want the circus. They just want to discuss the issues. You know, that's it, plain and simple. You know, they just want to make sure that their taxes are, are low, that they're able to, you know, uh, put clothes on their children. Um, they, they don't want all of this revenge nonsense. Sure. And so it's, it's exhausting. And, and on the Democratic side, too, you were known as a very conservative governor. When mm -hmm. you went in, a conservative Democrat, you ran, you, you, you were not going to raise taxes, uh, and, uh, and that, was, that was your platform. Now, um, uh, you know, you, you would have trouble in some areas of this country and even some areas of, of Nevada. Oh, like, absolutely. Absolutely. Know? It's a very, the lines have been made a lot bolder and a lot deeper and a lot stronger, which is, I think, unfortunate. And I think it's unfortunate for the next generation coming along because they didn't get to experience the better way that we're doing it as far as I'm concerned about uh, being a moderate and reaching across party lines as people talk about, as Senator Rosen talks about, she's a bipartisan senator. Uh, we don't have an awful lot of that at the state or at the federal level anymore. And, and John McCain, look at John McCain. And, and that's so ironic because uh, as we all know in the, in the era of executive orders that that, uh, that began with President Obama, continued under President Trump. You know, you lurch back and forth between government policies with executive orders as, as opposed to legislation. Because, and, and it's understandable because legislation can't get passed because of the, 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 the divide. But the only thing that really enacts durable change is legislation. Mm -hmm. you, you have to have a law. Uh, to, to, to make durable change. You can't just do it with executive orders. It can be you know, you done away with yeah. the, when the next guy takes over or right. the next woman takes over, right. excuse me. Right. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we live in a, in a day and age where you do have um, politicians who are quick to look for that camera or post a selfie or post uh, something outrageous on, on X to get people riled up. And how many likes yeah. they get or right. how many retweets. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's right. post photos yep. on Instagram. You know, I mean, it, how about just go to work? Go to work and, and quit with this nonsense. You know, maybe, maybe we should make it a lot they need to uh, not have social media. Yeah. Just right. go to work. <laughs>